Welcome. Welcome to Wofford College. I am delighted that you've joined us this evening for another terrific event brought to our community by Van Hip and the Hip Center for International Affairs and National Security. The living history presenters that you saw in the lobby and are in this hall with us this evening certainly set the tone for the speakers to come, including South Carolina Governor, the Honorable Henry McMaster, and representatives from the National Park Service, the American Battlefield Trust, and the SC 250th Commission. It's an honor to welcome all of you to Wofford College this evening. And I'd like to thank Dr. Ken Banks, Associate Professor of History here at the college, for moderating the discussion. And of course, our friend Van Hip, Wofford class of 1982, who has made this event and many other thought-provoking events on our campus and in our community possible. Van is chairman of the American Defense International in Washington, DC. Although many of you might know him as a sideline commentator during Terrier football games, never missing a game, traveling around the world to be on the sideline of a Wofford Terrier football game. We are always glad Van returns home to Wofford College in whatever capacity, and I welcome here, him here to the stage tonight. Thank you. Thank you, President Sam Hatt, and I want to thank uh, all of you for being here uh, tonight. There are a few folks that I do want to, uh, uh, to recognize, a few special guests. We're honored tonight to have uh, someone who's come back home, the First Lady of South Carolina, Peggy McMaster, who's from Spartanburg. First Lady, we're glad, we're glad to have you here tonight. Also, I understand that uh, State Senator Josh Kimbrell has just arrived. I want to thank Senator Kimbrell for being here. Um, we've got uh, a real national treasure. Afterwards, I think many of you have seen many of the reenactors and the living historians. You've even got the cannon out front. You, um, one person who is a national treasure, uh, Jenny Cody, a great author of children's historical books on the American Revolution, Declaration of Independence, you name it, recipient of the C.S. Lewis Award a couple of years ago and been called America's C.S. Lewis. Jenny, I want to thank you for being here. And then someone who, uh, uh, a name uh, in Spartanburg politics going back many years, back in the late uh, 1970s, actually early 70s, a state, rep state representative from Spartanburg co-authored the concurrent resolution for the South Carolina General Assembly calling on the National Park Service to make cow pens a national battlefield. Former state representative Richard Hines is with us tonight. <laughs> forward to tonight because this is a special day the 242nd anniversary of the battle of Calpins. if you go back to 1781 on this date the young republic was literally teetering many thought it was lost but for the scots irish of the backwoods of south carolina who came together to turn the tide in the american revolutionary war and begin a chain of events that would lead to the ultimate sur uh, surrender of the british at yorktown it is appropriate to honor 
those early American pioneers who did so much to give us the freedom that we enjoy today. And I'm looking forward to hearing the speakers today and I want to join President Sam Hatton thanking the American Battlefield Trust, the National Park Service Superintendent Diana Bramble, uh, the, the, the 250th. And one person I'm looking forward to hearing from is this park ranger, Will Caldwell. Now, let me tell you why. My fifth great grandfather was James Carl Caldwell, who was a sharpshooter at the Battle of Cal Pendle, later went on to be the sheriff of Newberry County. So we're going to have to compare notes uh, on our family tree after this. But um, I've known Governor McMaster since the 1980s. He was the first United States attorney that Ronald Reagan picked throughout the entire nation. He has served South Carolina with distinction as attorney general, as lieutenant governor, was inaugurated again last week, and when this term is over, will be the longest serving governor in the history of South Carolina. During the pandemic, he kept our businesses, our schools, and our churches open. Through his efforts and economic development efforts, he has brought jobs, jobs, jobs to the people of South Carolina in, un in un unprecedented numbers. And just a few months ago, was elected, was re-elected by, by an historical margin. But let me tell you about the Henry McMaster I know. He is loyal, he is sincere, and he loves South Carolina. He loves South Carolina, he loves her people, and he loves our state's history. It's an honor tonight to have Governor Henry McMaster kick off this commemoration of the 242nd anniversary of the Battle of Calpens, what we call and say that the American uh, Revolutionary War was won in South Carolina. Please join me in welcoming, giving a warm welcome to the governor of South Carolina, Henry McMaster. Thank you, Graham. This is this is a lot of fun. I don't, I'm glad to see so many people in one spot interested in history. Uh, Y'all know the great actor Charlton Heston. He was in a lot of movies of great historical characters, and he said that in his life of studying for roles and reading history, he has discovered that not only is history an important subject, but it is the only subject. And I, I tend to agree with that. And I think uh, my hat is off to everyone that is involved in this terrific event. I'll, I'll be brief. I want to hear what these experts have to say, to hear their insights. But uh, Van, you, thank you for that. And, and I do love history. And this, uh, this is a great, great state. And the history is always about the people. It's always the people. And you remember, some of you will remember the little ditty some things, a little thing happened here, and that causes another thing. There was one that said the the, the shoe was talking about a horseshoe. The shoe, for want, for want of the nail, the shoe was lost. For want of the shoe, the horse was lost. For want of the horse, the rider was lost. For want of the rider, the message was lost. For want of the message, the battle was lost. For want of the battle... The wall was lost, all for the want of a nail. And it goes in the other direction, too. Some of you may remember the great, great Christmas time movie, It's a Wonderful Life, starring Jimmy Stewart, where the, he was fed up, everything was going wrong, and decided to kill himself, and he was rescued by an angel, and he went back and looked at what the town of Bedford Falls would look like had he not been born. And it was a horrible place, and it is a fascinating movie if you ever get a chance to watch it. But it just shows how one thing here, one thing there, one person here, one person there can make an extraordinary difference and turn the tide of history. And that is exactly what happened in South Carolina. But again, it's always about the people. I, I found a little quote you might find interesting. This is, uh, this is an actual quote. In 1777, King George wanted a census of all the people in the colonies. You remember there were 13. Grafton County, New Hampshire, where Dartmouth College is located today, made its report through the county clerk who wrote, and I quote, Your Royal Majesty, Grafton County, New Hampshire, 
consists of 1,212 square miles. It contains 6,489 souls, most of whom are engaged in agriculture. But included in that number are 69 wheelwrights, eight doctors, 29 blacksmiths, 87 preachers, 20 slaves, and 90 students at the new college. There is not but one lawyer, for which fact we take no personal credit, but thank an almighty and merciful God. <laughs> now, Van and I lawyers, I don't know how many more we have in the room, but uh, I, I presume that's okay with everyone tonight for, for this, this event. Just a few things. Let's roll the clock back a little bit past 1777. Let's go to 1739. If any of you would like to come by the office one day, I'll show you an etching that's on my wall. It was uh, presented to me by the archives department. It's framed and it's an etching, a drawing of the city of Charleston from the view of Sullivan's Island. And it is dated 1739, 1739. It's accompanied by a report that is inscribed on it and is addressed as follows, and I quote, his, this is, his Excellency James Glenn, Esquire, Captain General, Governor and Commander in Chief in and over His Majesty's Province of South Carolina and Vice Admiral of the same, it goes on, humbly inscribed by his much obliged humble servant, B. Roberts. It was, and according, according to the inscription, quote, published according to an act of parliament by B. Roberts and W. H. Toms, dated June 9, 1739. What did it say? It said as follows, and I'm leaving out parts of it because it's longer than this, but it reads as follows. Charlestown, the metropolis of the province of South Carolina, is pleasantly situated between Cooper and Ashley Rivers. The climate of Carolina is extremely agreeable and wholesome and may well be looked upon as the most temperate part of the habitable earth. It is the fairest and most fruitful province belonging to Great Britain. Its silk is preferable to any and its rice is the best in the world. So it is no wonder that Charlestown be now a very great and flourishing town adorned with handsome and commodious buildings, among which the Church of St. Philip may justly be reckoned the finest structure in America. This town and province may justly be esteemed the most flourishing of any of His Majesty's dominions in America. Well, I believe Mr. Roberts' uh, estimation was right uh, we know that it was shared by the French and Spanish explorers and their sovereigns years and years before that and by the Native Americans who were here before them. And I think it is uh, it's still true today, of course, with the notable exception that South Carolina is no longer belongs to King George, but to us, to our great benefit. Unmentioned in all of this, but implicit in that success observed by Mr. B. Roberts, is the character, nature, and circumstances of the inhabitants of the province of South Carolina, that is, the people, some of whom we'll talk about tonight. According to the historian Walter Edgar, our, the, the early inhabitants had arrived at different times under a variety of conditions from where? From eight European countries, as many as 25 West African cultures, which today comprise four countries, and over 25 Native American nations, some of them bearing names that you would remember and notice on our maps today, such as Congaree, Cumbie, Kiowa, Catawba, Waccamaw, P.D., Edisto, and even more. Through those years and centuries long ago, and even up to our memories, our people have seen it all. People of this state, starting way back then, have seen everything. Hurricanes, fires, floods, tornadoes, earthquakes, piracy, Indian wars, indentured servitude, slavery, a revolutionary war, and since then, a civil war, world wars, and all the others. No state, I believe no state, has a more fascinating, momentous, and consequential history than our own. And through it all, and perhaps because of it, we have grown, flourished, and endured. And we were doing so in 1776 
And that is when we were, we were, according to all the writings, the richest of all of the colonies in the New World, of all the 13 colonies. Perhaps that is the reason that the British knew that they must subdue South Carolina if they were going to stop the revolution. They had to subdue South Carolina, but they failed to do it. They couldn't do it. And I've asked the General Assembly to provide some funds that will, millions of dollars that will go towards for, for grants and other services that will teach these lessons to our people. The Revolutionary War was won here, I believe, and I look forward to hearing about it from these guests tonight. One thing I'll say a few weeks ago, we had, uh, after the election, the National Governments Association uh, had a, a meeting in Charleston, which uh, Peggy and I, I hosted. And we encouraged all of the governors there and their staff members that uh, were there to, to go walk around the city and just take a look at, and see what they see. And I wish you could have been there to see their faces when they came back. Most of them had not been to Charleston. Most of them had not been to South Carolina. They were from out west. And by the way, it was interesting. They, they were astonished with the depth and breadth of the, of the history and the culture and the heritage and all that they saw. And they were making comments that said, those houses we passed by are 100 years old and now states are. So, well, that's right, because we have been through it all, and we're here now, and I believe that the young people can learn from this celebration that is taking place. So I want to encourage the young people to learn as much as you can about the history of this state, because it is a great, great history, and it will provide you with much guidance in what is, is coming next, of which uh, you will be a part. So thank you very much for letting Peggy and me join you. Van D, thank you very much for, for, for doing this. And I'd urge the young people particularly to remember that this place is the best place in the whole world to live, work, and raise a family. Thank you. Thank you, Governor McMaster. And now it's a pleasure to introduce our moderator uh, tonight, Wofford's own Dr. Ken Banks, Associate Professor of History. Many of you have seen him involved in other activities relating to American history, the American Revolutionary War. He was named South Carolina Professor of the Year in 2019 by the South Carolina Independent Colleges and Universities. Uh, he has held several major fellowships in American history, including the renowned American and Aquarian Society in Massachusetts, and the John Carter Brown Library at Brown University. And his second book project, a biography about a smuggling sea captain during the American Revolutionary War, has already attracted the attention of five major publishers. Dr. Ken Banks. Thank you. Before, before we get the uh, ball rolling here, I want to do just a couple of things very, very quickly. First of all, as you came in, of course, you saw, and I'm going to bungle this, but we had living history demonstration by Eddie Davis and his crew of the Upstate. I forget the actual name, so maybe if Eddie, if you can help me out here. But let's give them a hand, please. What a I hope you're as excited as I am to be here tonight to commemorate the Battle of Calpins and the meaning of what Calpins represents. Um, I'm, you're not, I, I had a 25 page lecture that I was going to start with, but don't worry, I'm actually not going to do that. I'd actually rather hear these folks myself. I want to say just a couple of things. First of all, picking up on what Governor McMaster said about young folks and the importance of history to young folks. I just want to say this, we're going to hear some stories about courage, we're going to hear some stories about fortitude, about loyalty under fire, we're going to hear stories about hardship, but especially 
I would like to have everyone think a moment about sacrifice, because that to me is what Calvin's represents. And I think that's why it's so important that people spend that time trying to think and learn from the sacrifice that people made in the past, regardless of what that sacrifice is, but a sacrifice to establish equity, to establish pride, and to establish a republic. And definitely, South Carolina was a focal point of that. Now, without further ado, I'm going to call on, and, and uh, hopefully my, my new colleagues here will forgive me if I get this a little bit wrong, but I'd like to call on first superintendent of Calpins National Battlefield uh, Park, the uh, Calpins National, I'll say this properly, Diana Graham, superintendent of the South Carolina Calvin's National Battlefield and Kings Mountain National Military Park. I didn't have that one memorized, sorry. And she is going to introduce um, our main speaker, or one of our main speakers, I should say, which is Mr. Kettlewell. Without further ado, Superintendent Bramble, let's give her a big hand, please. Thank you so much. Um, we're really excited to be here this evening. Again, thank you, Van, for giving me a call and getting this set up. Uh, this is just really exciting. Um, so today is the 242nd anniversary of the Battle of Calpens. It happened January 17, 1781. 242 years ago. That's it's it's so hard to even wrap my head around how long ago that was. Many of the events associated with the American Revolution, the Southern Campaign of the American Revolution in particular, took place literally in our backyards. Calpens National Battlefield is just one of those places, and it's only a few minutes up the road if you've never been there. Parks such as Calpens, uh, they were established in order to pr preserve the lands associated with this incredibly important history. In preserving those lands, we also create places which provide tangible locations where we can connect with the significant events in our nation's history. Because when you think about it, we really are all connected. Making these connections through our shared history helps us to understand who we were and then decide who we want to be and determine what kind of nation we want to leave for the future generations of Americans. Preserving these important places provides us an opportunity where we can continue to work together to tell the stories of what happened here and connect with our shared history. It's incredibly important that we continue to do so. This region has such a deep, rich history. There are incredible stories of people who did extraordinary things, and we have the unique privilege to be the tellers of those stories. So with that, it's my great pleasure to introduce one of these fantastic storytellers, Ranger William Caldwell. He's one of the most talented interpreters that I've ever had the pleasure of working with, and he spent his whole life here. He's from Spartanburg, South Carolina, and has dedicated his career to understanding these incredible stories of these incredible people and sharing them with all of you. Ranger Will. So good evening, everyone. The American Revolutionary War was won in South Carolina, and we are so humble about it. When I heard the title of tonight's program, I immediately knew what I wanted to talk about, and that was this statement. Why do we say this? Now, I've been teaching about the era of the Revolutionary War for about 15 years now, which to some is just a drop in the bucket. But in that time, I've seen this, this increasing appreciation of our backyard battles, the hundreds of fights and clashes that are scattered across our state. And I've seen a, a growing awareness of the roles of our hometown heroes. Besides the big founding fathers' names, uh, our local guys, who we like to use their superhero names, I call them, men like the Wizard Owl, the Gamecock, and of course the, the Swamp Fox, Francis Marion. And of course, I'm sure many of you have heard and many of you maybe have used that tagline of how South Carolina had more battles in the revolution than any other state. It was mentioned tonight. But did this win the Revolutionary War? How did the ability to kill our neighbors better than any other state win the revolution? Now, if you ask that question to the Continental Army General, Nathaniel Green, he would have said, it didn't. No, that's not what won the war. 
He says almost as much in a letter to one of those militia leaders, Thomas Sumter, in January of 1781. He wrote and said that partisan strokes in war are like the garnish of a table. They give splendor to the army and reputation to the officers, but they afford no substantial national security. But South Carolina is not just these fights. We're not just backyard battles. There is a list of significant events that took place here in South Carolina. You're looking at the first battle of the revolution that wasn't up in New England, happening here in 96 South Carolina. And the revolution meant different things to different people. For example, you have the South Carolinians forming one of the main components, the main arms of the Cherokee War of 1776, arguably the largest organized coordinated attack against an American Indian nation anywhere in the revolution, uh, resulting in the destruction of 50 to 52 of their towns. Some historians have said that it was in South Carolina that you saw the most enslaved Africans and African Americans able to regain their freedom due to either the chaos of the war or the, uh, the freedom offers made by both sides, but especially the British. And South Carolina is home to amazing underdog stories. And how else would you describe the defense of Charleston Harbor in June of 1776 when the British Royal Navy is turned back by this half-completed, half-finished fortification on Sullivan's Island, the hearts of oak, the mighty British Navy broken by the Carolina Palmetto. Now, this great story, though, is kind of eclipsed four years later when the British return. The empire strikes back, and they return and capture the fort, the harbor, the city, and the entire southern continental army, making our state home to the single biggest British victory of the entire war, a victory that has been just highlighted further that summer with additional victories at Camden, Waxhaws, Fishing Creek. But then we're also home to where those embers of rebellion were kept alive. Places like Kings Mountain on October 7th, 1780. And then places where those embers of rebellion were fanned back into a flame of open revolution like Cowpens on January 17th, 1781, as you've heard today's anniversary, the event that brings us here tonight. And it's easy to get excited about these, to look at what happened here in our state, see how it impacted our state and our people and say, yes, this must be why we won the war. But if we're going to make these claims, these statements that we won the revolution, that's a big picture statement. You have to look big picture. So briefly, let's look big picture. Let's look at what is happening in a six month window. Beginning in the summer of 1780, you have the big British victories at Charleston, Camden, and then let's end that window in the spring of 1781 when that same British army, Lord Cornwallis, they're led on a wild goose chase all the way to the Virginia border, the race to the Dan River. So what is happening in this window? Well, up north, you have General George Washington, about 8,000 men under his command there, getting ready for a second horrible winter at Morristown, New Jersey. A winter that is so filled with disease and desertion that you're gonna see two Continental Army mutinies during that encampment. Now, they are recently joined, however, over in Newport, Rhode Island, by 5,000 French who have arrived to aid us in our war. But even this combined force is not enough to threaten Sir Henry Clinton, the British commander in New York City. And even though he is outnumbered, his defenses are so strong, the Royal Navy is so dominant that any attack against him is, is completely out of the question. So what's happening in the South? Lord Cornwallis is in command of the Southern British Army. And in this window, he is holding every key coastal city, Mobile, Pensacola, St. Augustine, Savannah, Charleston, Wilmington, all firmly under British control. And they are holding the back country, the inner part of the state with a chain of fortifications, places like Augusta, 96, Rocky Mount, Camden, just to name a few. And who is supposed to stop him? Who is supposed to push the British back to the coast but the shattered remnants of the Continental Army, reeling from this summer of defeats, trying to put Humpty Dumpty back together again, way up in Hillsborough, North Carolina, over 100 miles away from our state's border. This is when we get that hope kept alive, those embers of rebellion kept going with Kings Mountain on October 7th, 1780. You have British Major Patrick Ferguson leading an army of loyal Carolina loyalists heading as the left wing of the British Army, their western flank, heading towards the Blue Ridge Mountains. You're going to see him and his army pursued, surrounded, and defeated at Kings Mountain National Military Park, now in Blacksburg, South Carolina. With the death of Ferguson, the defeat of his army, this is the destruction of the British plan to use the Carolina loyalists, to use these people as a key part of their southern strategy. This is the hope that the Americans needed to keep going. Now, this defeat is going to so...
discourage the Carolina loyalists. I want to read to you part of this report that comes from Lord Cornwallis when he hears of what's happened at Kings Mountain. He writes saying that the militia, meaning the loyalist militia of 96 district, on which alone we could place the smallest dependence, was so totally disheartened by the defeat of Ferguson that of that whole district we could with difficulty assemble only 100 men. And even those, I am convinced, would not have made the smallest resistance if they had been attacked. Now, not only do the British recognize this moment, but the Americans do as well. And they remember this moment. Thomas Jefferson, decades after the war, in the 1820s, just a few years before his death, he's been governor of wartime Virginia. He's been president of the United States. The Louisiana Purchase happened with him. But when they ask him about Kings Mountain, he has to say this. I remember well the deep and grateful impression made on the mind of every one by that memorable victory. It was the joyful enunciation of that turn of the tide of success which terminated the Revolutionary War with the seal of our independence. Hope's been kept alive. Now, General Nathaniel Green is going to arrive here in the South, try to take over putting that army back together, and he's going to find such a horrible state of conditions, no food, clothing, no support from some of the local militia leaders and governors that he's going to write back explaining his situation. One of his letters is going to say that when I left the northern world, I expected to meet difficulties in this, but they are multiplied infinitely beyond my apprehension. So what is he going to do? With these pieces of his army, he's going to take one of those sharpest shards and put it in the hands of a man named Daniel Moore. Daniel Morgan is this legendary American leader, even in his own time during the war. He's this epic officer. And with this piece, this piece of an army, he is sent here into the western parts, the backcountry of South Carolina. His orders to spirit up the people, to ride that wave of success from Kings Mountain and say, look, there is still hope. Do not give up the war. Do not give up the rebellion. We can still win this thing. And when the British learn about this, they can't have it. They cannot see their control of South Carolina continue to erode with this presence of the Continentals. So they send one of their best, young, aggressive officers to stop it. Bannister Tarleton is 26 years old, never lost a battle. And he is leading an army of elite veteran troops. One British officer actually called his men the flower of Lord Cornwallis's army, the best and the brightest. And for weeks, they're going to pursue Daniel Morgan, finally catching up to him in a cow field a cattle pasture just a few minutes up the road, which you can come visit. And 30 minutes later, Daniel Morgan is going to report back that he received Tarleton and gave him a devil of a whipping. Tarleton barely escapes with his life and a fraction of his army and hundreds of those elite British veterans are now lost. These troops that were so essential to the British maintaining their control of South Carolina. Now, Lord Cornwallis in command here in the South is going to realize he has to change how he's doing this. He cannot chase after all these little groups of people. He needs to get the Continentals, take them out of the war, and crush that hope, crush that hope of them winning. So he begins chasing after Nathaniel Green, chasing the Continental Army, leading to the race to the Dan River, that wild goose chase all the way up to the Virginia border, where again he has to stop and rethink his plan. Now, one British officer who was along with this campaign and wrote extensively about this after the war, Charles Stedman, he wrote about this moment saying that every disaster that befell Lord Cornwallis after Tarleton's most shameful defeat at the Cowpens may most justly be attributed to the imprudence and unsoldierly conduct of that officer in the action. So what is Lord Cornwallis going to do? He changes his mind again and thinks, okay, I cannot win the Carolinas. I cannot defeat the Carolinas in this way. I have to take Virginia out of the war first, then reassess the situation, maybe then come back down. So he heads north. And when he goes north, General Green comes back south. And he begins applying pressure to that chain of fortifications across South Carolina. If he didn't capture them outright, he applies enough pressure that the British are forced to evacuate. Places like Camden, Augusta, 96, Fort Mott, Fort Granby start to fall to the Patriot hands as the British increasingly shrink down to the Charleston area. Now, on October 19th, 1781, 12 months and 12 days after the Battle of Kings Mountain, nine months and two days after the Battle of Cowpens, Lord Cornwallis and his veterans of this Carolina campaign are forced to surrender at Yorktown, Virginia. That is the end of the road for them, but that road began here in South Carolina. Now, Nathaniel Green is not done. It's going to take another 14 months of fighting 
pressure, skirmishing, squeezing the British into Charleston until they finally surrender. And the last uniformed British soldiers and thousands of Carolina loyalists are forced to evacuate on December 14th, 1782. The peace treaty ending the war is gonna be ratified less than a year later. So when we make this statement that the American Revolutionary War was won in South Carolina, we have to remember for ourselves, but maybe remind our listeners, this is not our idea. These are not our words. This is nothing new. This is not a park ranger telling you this or a South Carolina historian, but these are the words of the men who were there. These are the reports from men like Cornwallis, Green, Stedman, Morgan, militia officers from both sides. They point to South Carolina as what ended it. For the British, it was in South Carolina that their plan to use the Carolina loyalists fell apart and their chain of fortifications, their outposts across the backcountry began to get their links broken. For the Patriots, it was in South Carolina that time and again, they bought the chance they needed to rebuild the Continental Army and kept those embers of rebellion alive. So this is not the words from us, but from the words of the men who bled and led in the American Revolution. The American Revolutionary War was won in South Carolina. Thank you. This is a kind of excellent storytelling. This makes me want to be a student again. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, I'd now like to introduce uh, Charles Baxley, and he is doing an enormous amount of work for the state of South Carolina and for the people of South Carolina that you probably don't know about and have never heard about, but we're going to hear a little bit about it now. He is the chairman of the South Carolina American Revolution and forgive me if I trip over this, Sester Centennial I did, Commission, which is going to celebrate, of course, South Carolina's role in the 250th anniversary. Mr. Baxter, please. Well, it's wonderful to be back in Spartanburg and especially at Wofford. Um, I cannot talk top Mr. Caldwell's presentation. He did such a wonderful job and had such a wonderful delivery. I do want you to know, though, there is some other stories about um, the victory at Calpins that I'd like to share with you a little bit today. And they start here in the old Spartanburg district when um, Ms. Fortune and I, our executive director, came into town this afternoon. I said, let's go right out to Croft State Park. I'd like to go out there because I'd like to pay my respects to Jane Black Thomas. Now, you want to know how Calpins was won? Look at Jane Black Thomas. South Carolina and Georgia got together in 1775 and stole 16,000 pounds of gunpowder from the British near Tybee Island. Now, 16,000 gun pounds of gunpowder, you say, well, that's just old gunpowder, it's no good. That'd be enough to take all this university off the map. So it's pretty important. Half of it they send to George Washington at the siege of um, Boston. The other half of it they spread around South Carolina, including giving about 500 pounds of powder to Jane Black Thomas's husband, John Thomas Sr., who is the local militia commander. Spread it out so it's available to be used. So Mr. Thomas is off um, doing something Jane Black Thomas is at her fortified home with her son-in-law and her children. She's a grandmother. She's a Scots-Irish grandmother, though. I happen to be married to one of those. I know a lot about them. The loyalists show up in her yard, demand that she surrender the gunpowder. She surrendered it all right. Yeah, she stuck a gun out the window and started shooting at them and kept up the fire, she and her son-in-law with the children loading the rifles in her shooting until the neighbors came and ran the loyalist off. Now, in 1776, when you have ladies in the back country of South Carolina in this area who will stand up for American liberty, for the American ideal of self-determination, yes, 
we're going to win it. We're, yes, we're going to win it, gal fins. Number two, and this is really amazing. There are two precursor battles that, in my opinion, have to be won before the Americans can win cow pens. Number one is a place called Hammond's Old Store. Hammond's Old Store was lost to knowledge about where it was. Uh, we have luckily found it with the 250 Commission working. We've worked with the South Carolina Battleground Trust and ABT to acquire the site. It's about three miles south of Clinton, South Carolina. There was a bunch of Georgia loyalists marauding through this area of South Carolina. And they were robbing, they were taking cows, horses, burning houses, whatever, just you know, working on the Patriots any way they could. And those people had to be taken care of or the militia, the local militia could not turn out and support Daniel Morgan. So Morgan detaches two men, William Washington, cousin of George Washington's cavalry and James McCall, Long Cane's militia mounted. They go to Hammond's old store. They absolutely defeat the loyalists. The loyalists captured, killed, or scattered, and they are no longer a thorn in this area of South Carolina's side. Secondly, Thomas Sumter. Y'all have heard of Thomas Sumter. You didn't know he was up here. He went to a place called Blackstock's Plantation. Blackstock's is probably one of the most beautiful pieces of property in South Carolina that is a pristine battlefield. There, he fought and stopped Thomas Sumter. He stopped Bannister Tarleton with just militia. So red-coated British lay dying in the field at Blackstock's plantation, at militia's hands from North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia, that proved that Tarleton was not indefeatable. In, in that proved to all those soldiers that went to Calpins, hey, we can stop this man. He's not invincible. So those two important South Carolina battles some just militia, like the Thomas Sumter one, some cooperation of militia and Continental soldiers at Hammond's Old Store, set the stage just as the guts and determination of that Scots-Irish woman. And Peggy, when you came in, I said, I got to talk about Jane Black Thomas from Spartanburg. They set the tone of the resistance. And when you have people who believe in the idea of liberty, even, even when you have no money, when you have no organized government, when you have no organized um, uh, system of supply, of getting bullets, of getting powder, you still win because the people's hearts and minds were with this idea of self-determination. I'm telling you all that because there's a big story. Calpins is enormously important in winning the American Revolution. But these two other battlefields are too. So we want South Carolinians to be proud of their heritage. We want them to know what happened. We want to know who fought here. We, know, we want them to know about sacrifice. We want them to know that their forefathers fought to change the way the world looked at government. Because before the American Revolution, there was a few little experiments with democracy, but basically you got an inherited king, a hereditary king. After the American Revolution, we went it on our own to try an elected government where we get to pick who our leaders are. And thank you, Governor McMaster, for this opportunity. So, yes, not only did we win the revolution here in South Carolina, we changed the world in South Carolina. Our people need to know these stories. They need to know, they need to be able to tell these stories. And we want other people, visitors, to come from all over the world and hear what we accomplished here in South Carolina so that we can share this piece of our culture and that we can do it better than anywhere else because our sites are beautiful and our stories are great. So that's what your 250th commission is up to, discovering and telling these stories and getting communities ready to receive cultural heritage tourists who are going to come here whether we invite them or not. 
The 250th is an international phenomenon. They're going to come. People are coming. We got to get ready. And we're working to get ready. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Mr. Baxley. And now somebody else you may not have heard of before, but is also doing some extremely important work, also for the future of history, if I can speak that way, in South Carolina. And that is Catherine Noyes. I'm going to ask her to speak. Catherine is a staff person with the American Battlefield Trust. And she is also working a lot on establishing the Liberty Trail portion in South Carolina. Now, most of you may not know that that's actually underway, but we're going to hear a little bit more about that right now. Please welcome Catherine Noyce. Hi, good evening, everyone. I first wanted to start by thanking Van Huff, who is a member of our board at the American Battlefield Trust, for inviting us to participate tonight. We're so glad to be here. Um, just a little bit, bit of background about the American Battlefield Trust. We are a national nonprofit organization that is devoted to the preservation of Revolutionary War, War of 1812, and Civil War battlefields. Um, in the organization's history uh, of about 30 years, we've preserved over 55,000 acres of battlefield land in 25 different states. And really our mission is to preserve that land and educate the public about what happened there and why it's still so important today. Um, as we're nearing the 250th commemorations that we've been talking about tonight, there's so many opportunities to tell these stories of the Revolutionary War, and we are really focused on looking for projects that shine a light on the history of the Revolutionary War and help people understand that history and why it's so important to us. And one of those premier projects for the American Battlefield Trust is the Liberty Trail. The Liberty Trail is an effort to preserve, interpret, and promote the key Revolutionary War battlefields of South Carolina. As we've talked about tonight, there are so many, and there's so many untold and underappreciated stories that we really want to help people see and understand, and we want to help people, we want to encourage people to come here and visit these battlefields. Um, to date, we've already preserved over 700 acres of Revolutionary War battlefield land across South Carolina at 10 different battlefield sites. Um, we've also launched a mobile tour, the Liberty Trail app that you can download and use to visit currently 30 different battlefield sites around South Carolina with more to come in the future. Um, and we really see our efforts as complementing the work of the National Park Service and working in partnership with the South Carolina 250 Commission. We already have these amazing battlefield parks in South Carolina at Calpin, at Kings Mountain, 96, state parks like Musgrove Mill. But there are also sites that have been unpreserved for almost 250 years, and we still have a chance to preserve those sites for future generations, and also to bring interpretation to those sites so that they can be open to the public and that history can really be appreciated at the places where the events occurred. Um, so what we're focusing on now is the preservation of additional battlefield sites and the opening of new battlefield parks where we can bring really innovative interpretation that helps people engage with this history, bring signage to the sites, but also use technology, use augmented reality, virtual reality, bring on-site audio experiences where people can just start to really connect to these places and to these people and get more interested and more excited about this history. Um, because ultimately what we believe in is the power of place. When you stand on the ground where these events happen, it's an incredibly powerful experience. And so we want people to do that. Um, but we also want this history to be accessible to those who can't visit. And so you can access this through the web, through your phone, so that someone at their home or in a classroom can also connect with this history. Um, because we really do see these as outdoor classrooms that we want people to use. Um, and just the last thing I'll say about our work with the Liberty Trail and our work at the American Battlefield Trust is that we're just so excited about the partnership opportunities. The more we talk about this work, the more we talk about South Carolina and the revolution and how excited people get about sharing this history, um, the more we just want to bring all these groups together to do this work. Um, we really see this as a model opportunity for a public-private partnership. I mean, you look at the great partners uh, on the stage here tonight. I mean, we're so pleased and honored to work with the National Park Service, to work with the South Carolina 250 Commission. Um, and we're just really um, appreciate this opportunity to be a part of this conversation tonight and be a part of uh, sharing this history. So. Thank you so much. We're uh, nearly out of time. And what I'm going to do instead of 
try to kind of go through very quickly a question and answer sort of period of Q&A. I think I ask one question for our four panelists here. Give you a second to think about this. We've heard about stories, we've heard about hope, especially from Ranger Caldwell there, talking, I think, very eloquently about kindling of hope. Is there one hope, a story that sparks hope? that each of you can think of, and we've heard some great stories already, but a story of even a small something that you would hope that all of our folks here today will carry with them and think about as they look forward to the next commemoration of Calvin's, whether it's about Calvin's or perhaps another battlefield or another moment during the revolution in South Carolina. Anybody just charge the podium. <laughs> okay, Mr. Bassett. And you know what? You can just stay seated. That's fine. I, I think that's okay with you folks. I, I hope so, because I'm going to sit. So. One of my favorite characters in South Carolina in the American Revolution is Francis Marion. Francis Marion was lucky that he had an early biographer write a fantastic story about him. And then his story was picked up by none other than Walt Disney which helped people of my generation learn who Francis Marion was. But if you throw the Hollywood and all the 19th century BS all of the story, the story is amazing. Because here is a man who has no resources whatsoever except this grand idea in his head. And he goes into an area about a third of South Carolina, and he talks the local militia into not surrendering, not giving up, and going and fighting the most powerful nation in the world, the most powerful navy in the world, and they fight the British to a standstill in South Carolina. And when you have people like Jane Black Thomas, like her husband John, her son John Thomas Jr., when you have people like Daniel Morgan, and people like Francis Marion and Thomas Sumter, who stand up and say, count me in, count me in, I will fight, I will win this liberty for you. To me, that is the greatest hope. Great, fantastic. Do we have somebody else want to charge in? <laughs> <laughs> You're the boss. <laughs> um, so I'll actually take that and, and turn it a little bit differently. There are, our history is so complex. Um, the history of this nation is so incredibly complex, and the more I learn about the history of this region, I mean, it's just, it's a massive can of worms. Um, and it's just so interesting. And I, my hope really is that people can look at this history through maybe a different lens. You know, we all have different understandings of what happened to people in our past. We all have different understandings of why things happened and why they went the way that they did. And it's normal for people to have opinions about that. Um, what I hope is that we can take these experiences of others and learn from that and really use it to help build our future. Um, I see this as an opportunity for us in the parks to help carry the message forward of um, we, we really have the opportunity to decide what we want our future to look like. Um, we can use that history to understand that past and then make different decisions. And that's, that's all we have within our power. You know, you can easily sit and judge the decisions of another or the actions of another or what happens, but we have the ability and the power to make different decisions for the future. So that's my hope, is that you take that understanding and move forward. Thank you. Okay. Can I actually go to the right with what I was kind of thinking? <laughs> um, so one of my favorite things and to kind of define and uncover and kind of a hope is that if the story, this traditional narrative, doesn't really catch your attention. Uh, it's almost like an alien conspiracy. The truth is out there. Uh, my favorite thing is to find a story where the patriots are the bad guys. Um, either, uh, especially when you look at the story of the Old Mountain Victory National Disorder Trail, the Kings Mountain Campaign. One quote in particular I'm thinking of is that on October 14th, their commander, William Campbell, um, passes an order uh, for the plundering parties to stop going out from the army. He says that they are laying waste and stealing everything from the homes they pass, leaving their friends in a worse condition than the enemy would have done. 
Um, so being able to realize that there is so much more for us to learn, there's so many other perspectives and angles and different stories other than what we maybe traditionally hear. Um, that may be just what's needed to kind of whet somebody's appetite and really dive in and help us do more, to find more stories, to find more truth, to get a much bigger understanding of how the revolution happened, what it meant then, and what it means now. Thank you. Yeah. Sure. Um, I'm thinking about, you know, as Will and as Charles spoke tonight, about the hope and determination of individuals and how that could really impact the course of history. Um, I thought a lot about the preservation side of the story. You know, as we look at the efforts of an individual community to save a historic site or to save a battlefield, um, as we look at a lot of these sites around South Carolina, there are several where the daughters of the American Revolution, where they stepped in years, decades, and years ago, and they planted that flag of preservation, and they were able to start that effort that we can all build on today. So, you know, I think as we work with each individual community to tell their story of the revolution, um, and as we really encourage people to start visiting a lot of these rural areas and drive visitation into these areas that can also spur economic development in small communities, I think it's just really that, that notion that it can be just one person and their drive and determination that really um, makes a huge difference in that space. Great, fantastic. Let's give it a hand for us. Before we uh, break up here, I want to do one last thing, which is, aside from having you, when you leave here, think about stories of hope. I think that's a fantastic kind of thing, maybe for a celebration here a year from now. But I would like to give Mr. Hip Van Hip a huge hand here. Thank you so much for helping us. that you have probably not heard of, but I think also deserve a hand, and that is Melissa and Amanda. Please, who did the secretarial work to help put this together. Thank you very much, and we hope that you have learned something and maybe taken away something tonight. <laughs> We do have a reception starting. Uh, thank you for reminding me. We have a wonderful reception set up for you out here. And I believe that the Living History folks uh, are going to be hanging back for a little bit so you can have more time to talk to them. But please join us for the reception right now. See you there.